Speaking of which, I wonder if we can get, um, let's get, can we get a, uh, I'll have to search Etsy. Maybe someone's got a, a hacked Billy Bass that's been changed into Darius. <laughs> Only if it plays Freedom. <laughs> oh, I want <laughs> No, uh, how about how about you press the button one and it just keeps saying, I've always wanted sushi sashimi. Yes, I always wanted a thing called a tuna sashimi. <laughs> uh, All right. Or, or uh, in G. Darius mode, hit the button and have the fish, uh, Billy Bass, turn and look at you and say, meditation. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> The core cast. Welcome to Shoot the Corecast, the official companion podcast to the RF Generation Shmup Club. This is a family-friendly shmup-themed podcast that won't die of dysentery, but might succumb to zombify mummies. I'm Addicted, also known as Addicted to Shmups, and with me I have... Metal Fro, also known as Game Boy Guru. And if you would like to connect with the podcast, you can do so on Twitter at ShootCoreCast. You can also follow me directly at Game Boy Guru. You can find all the links to the feeds and various pages for our uh, podcast via Linktree, uh, linktr.ee slash shootthecorecast. You can join rfgeneration.com and join us for a future Shmup Club playthrough. And also, uh, please subscribe, like, rate, review, etc. of the podcast on your preferred platform. Yep, and we can join via the metaverse now, right? Um, I don't think we have a metaverse. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, that must be the Discord. Oh, that's right. Yes, uh, speaking of which, we are actually preparing a Shoot the Corecast Discord server. Um, thus far, we've been using the RF Generation Discord, and that's been fine, but we kind of have everything in all, all in one channel and it's a little bit hard to search through when I'm looking for high scores or for game discussion to refer reference and things like that so I'm thinking I've been thinking it's it would be easier if we had our own dedicated server that we can fully manage and have multiple channels so that's what we're doing we're going to be putting that out there soon I'm just putting together the basic structure and uh, then we'll get the links up and start putting out invitations. Sounds good. I finally have a place where I can post all my text Mexian memes. That's right. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, I do stream the Shmup Club game of the month multiple times throughout the month. So if you'd like to come and hang out while I do that and watch me die repeatedly, then follow me on twitch.tv slash guru game boy personally i follow because of the dogs well i think that's probably 90 percent of my audience ah uh, those parrot dogs yep so let's jump into our question of the month and i asked this question and then realized i've probably asked a variation of this before but it bears repeating uh, because I think it's relevant to the the game of the month here. So what video game took you by surprise and you ended up liking it way more than you anticipated? And right off the bat, Need New Shorts said Toon Shooters 2. Like other games people dismiss or probably consider shovelware, like The Monkey King, The Legend Begins on Wii, Toon Shooters 2 is an immensely fun game, at least to me. Lots of character choices, unlockable upgrades, super playable, underrated, spent a lot of time with it. This is one that I had not heard of, 
but just looking at the Steam page, it sort of looks, the art style reminds me of something that you would see on an iPhone or an iPad. Um, and I'm trying to think of the Endless Runner game that this reminds me of, that I played a ton on iPad. Um, but it sort of has a similar look, but it actually looks like it might be fun. So as of this recording, it's $2 on Steam. So probably worth taking a chance on at that price. Yeah, it sounds like it might be good to slot it in for a maybe a December December to remember release. <laughs> there you go. All right, our next comment comes to us from at Ponytatsujin. The Witness. I'm being dead serious. I thought it was going to hate it because I read the reviews that said it was boring, and I got it for free on my PS4. I'm on my sixth playthrough now, and I haven't finished the challenge. I have heard several people talk about this game being pretty good. Uh, you know, I played Mist and was engrossed by Mist and played a ribbon for love of it, but I sort of fell off the wagon after that. The Witness seems to have a lot of that where it's just like, hey, click on this, figure it out, and then teach yourself, and then you come back later and we go, oh, that's how you do it. You know, I'm... Ri- and one for cryptic puzzles. I don't uh, think I, I prefer s- really um, Sierra's way of doing things anymore. Where it's oh, you weren't you supposed to just realize you're supposed to pour water on the cactus and then use duct tape in order to get the hobo out of the well? I mean, it's just <laughs> obvious. So you know, I, I may not have the mindset for it anymore, but I've, I've heard it that the witness is pretty good, and you know, if we can get get it for free, I'll give it a shot. Are you saying you didn't know about the duct tape? I didn't know about the duct tape to get the hobo out of the well. <sighs> I know, I was trying to use the plung- the plunger and the needle and the space gun instead. Wow. I know. S- some people. You know, but I was, to be fair, I was only 16 at the time. Oh, well, allowances for youth. Uh, Shoot the Chorus says Demolition Man on the Sega Genesis. I have not played this one. If it involves Taco Bell and Tex Mex, in my men. <laughs> yes. Our next comment comes to us from the Collector Cast and Duke Togo, who amazingly did not say anything with Dark Souls. Tetrisphere I have no clue what it was about, and the game still sticks with me to this day. Now, uh, Tetrisphere that was on the N64, was that? I'm trying to think of I've got the right one. There's so many Tetris variants. That might be it. <clears throat> I'll have to give this one a try. We get this is not the first time it's come up there, and I there's a Tetris on. Uh, um, on the Virtual Boy, but I think that was like Tetris 4D or Tetris 3D. Either way, it just gave me a headache. I think that the the Virtual Boy was created to sell t- Tylenol. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, yeah, it, as long as I don't have to look into a Virtual Boy, I'll give it a shot. Thanks, Duke. Huh. Alrighty. Delta Tango 6 says, Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance. The reviews at the time were mediocre. Retrospective reviews are harsh. I gave it a shot, and not only is it not bad, it's a very good Castlevania game. I think most people who crap on it haven't really played it. Yeah, Harmony of Distance was one that I, I was surprised that it wasn't as bad as what you know, it said, but I think the expectations were so high. And the one that came after that one, uh, not Circle of the Moon, that was the first one that, shoot, the name escapes me, the one that, um, the the one that really took off, uh, Aria of Sorrow, I think is the one I'm looking for. Yeah. And then the one that, yep, had the DS remake. That did so well, I think this just sort of gets overshadowed. By itself, it's not a bad game, and I like what I played. It, uh, I would say that, you know, I'm talking about myself here, I need to go back and take another look at it, but I would say definitely give it a shot, and it's in the uh, uh, Castlevania collection that came out in the eShop. Yep. 
Yeah, I mean, I think people tend to bag on Circle of the Moon more, but yeah, this one doesn't get as much respect as I think as it deserves. I think part of the reason with Circle of the Moon was it was so darn hard to see anything at the time. You had the Game Boy Advance that required, you know, at least 15 lighting sources in order to be able to see it. <laughs> this is true. All right, our next comment comes to us from at Material Handle My- Handler Mike. Oh, be careful handling those materials, Mike. And it's Fallout 3. Yeah, Fallout 3 was... Definitely a departure from the series, and a lot of people. If you ask them what their favorite Fallout is, you're probably going to get New Vegas. Uh, but I had to say I, I like Fallout Three. I played it through, you know, buggy as it <laughs> as a Bethesda game is to the end. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Have you had any experience with the Fallout games? No, this is very much on my backlog, but. Uh... I've heard a lot of good things, so I definitely want to get around to this at some point. I think you should stream your playthroughs. That would be a good thing to do. I mean, at least do it before Breath of the Wild 2 comes out and you just uh, stream that for six years straight. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, Mr. Blade Symphony said Armored Core. Uh, Armor Core from software represent. Yeah, it's one of these series I tried on the PlayStation One and definitely liked, but I never followed up with the rest of the series. The PS Two, Three. Uh, have you played any of the Armor Cores? I have not. Oh, geez, another one for you to play. Yep. Um, you can't go wrong with a bunch of uh, mechs duking it out. So I've heard. All right, our next comment comes to us from at Zoido. Final Fantasy 15. As a longtime fan of the series, I wasn't too happy where Final Fantasy was going with 12, 13, and the spinoffs and sequels. The production of the game seemed to be a little too chaotic, and I was very skeptical about it. When I finally played it, I loved it. Yeah, 15 seems to be divisive. Either people enjoyed it, or... They didn't. My brain is going crazy with all the spin-offs and stuff here. Is was fifteen the one where they get in the car and go on a road trip? Yep. Oh, okay, and that was the one that I did be on the. The ending was just sad in some spot. I, yeah, I remember playing that through to the end, but in the majority, like ninety five percent of the game is with that first island. It was interesting. I liked some of the way they did it, but. Yeah, I don't know. I might have to uh, disagree with Zoido on this one, saying that I didn't as much. But at the same time, it was a little... It was different than the way that 12 was, where it was always these group of teenagers that can have the power to save the world, because once you become 20, you're an old man and no longer valid. <laughs> You know how that goes, right? Uh, on the air, um, or even looking at thirteen. I mean, thirteen. I played that through to the end, and after that, I said, "Nope, no more on there." Even though I hear, you know, th- th- talk about controversial. Uh, thirteen three is it gone in all sorts of really weird sort of direction there. Oh, lightning returns. Yeah, I, I know. I I tried, you know, but. I think what I'm going to do when the next one comes out, I'm going to wait for the Game Dave review. If if Game Dave loves it, I'll give it a shot. I mean, it, it's it's a five hundred dollar ticket in order to play a Final Fantasy game at this point. Yeah. Uh, our pal Corkman, who was on the previous episode with us, said for a shmup, Eskatos. I thought it was going to be a decent shmup, but nothing special. The two shot types, the different views and angles it makes you play at, and the manic pace and music is amazing. For other genre, Etrian Odyssey. Who knew drawing maps on a DS screen would be so much fun? 
Yeah, I had a lot of fun with Etrian Odyssey. I bought the first three on DS and didn't really follow one into the 3DS. But it was definitely a harken back to the old days of Wizardry or uh, Eye of the Beholder. A lot of fun to have in those ones. And Eschatos is one I've played just a little bit. I'm hoping that we can fit that in somewhere so that way I can spend more time with it. I assume you've spent more time with it. No. Unfortunately, I haven't. So that that's definitely a bit of a blind spot. But I know that there are some uh, cute apologists in the shmup community who are very much about Eschatos. And I know Ed has been a big fan for a long time. Yeah, and speaking of cute, isn't the um, Natsuki Nats- Chronicles coming out? Or Natsuki Chronicles? But isn't it supposed to be coming out this year? Uh, finally in physical form? I'm hoping so. It's been a while. That's true, but I still have more hope in that coming out than anything from Dispatch. Unfortunately, yes. I think if you look up vaporware under the dictionary now, you just find dispatch games. You're not wrong. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, Let's move this from being depressing here. Our next comment comes to us from Andrew. Rev or uh, Ruv Second Zero Ranger. I thought this game is like, well, it looks like Radiant Silver Gun. Perhaps I can't get into it. I don't know why the game just hooks me more than I like it. A uh, Radiant, sorry, not Radiant Silver Gun. Uh, Zero Ranger. That is one that I still go back to and play. I a game to have just the right amount of challenge you know, and <laughs> replayability. I will play that game any day. In fact, it's one of the games that I'm hoping to play once I pick up a Steam Deck in the next couple of years. Oh, nice. Yeah, Zero Ranger is quality. Uh, Sentient 6 says Crackdown. Now, I'm assuming this is Crackdown on the 360 and not the arcade or Sega Genesis game. Or the Metal Gear Solid bootleg. <laughs> uh, if you if you look at it, there is a bootleg hack of Crackdown for the Genesis that was made and renamed to Metal Gear Solid in order to sell it in uh, gray markets. Oh my! Yeah. Well, hey, I mean, it's got a, it's got a ticking clock, so I guess it must be a spy thriller. <laughs> but uh, Crackdown, yeah, Crackdown was one of those games that I think. At first, people bought it because they wanted to play the Halo 3 beta. Oh, but sure. It, it, it's sort of a really interesting game on its own. I feel bad because the series has gone downhill. 2 was eh at best, and 3 was downright what the heck. So, oh. I, mean, I mean, there's a reason why 3 is like $8. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, Terry Bradshaw is good, but he shouldn't be in a game where that doesn't do him any justice. It's I, I, it, it, Three feels extremely phoned in. Two oh. is sort of has some qualities, but one is where it's at. And if you look at the Japanese cover of it, I think it was done by the same artist who does uh, Lupin. You know, Lupin the Third. Oh, sure. And the anime on there. So it look, it's, it look. You're thinking here, here's the American cover of, the, you know, one of those. Uh, what's the best way of describing this? I guess w- in America we have Angry Kirby, or in Japan they have Happy Kirby. You know, you, you, in America he's always frowning on the <laughs> cover of the games. Even in Japan he's always smiling. And it's sort of that way too, where it's crackdown in the U.S. version. It's very much like. <laughs> Like, oh, yeah, we've got bros doing bro things, you know, explosions, you know, action film. Right. But in Japan, it's very anime. It, it's funny you mentioned that because that's um, – the Japanese version is called Riot Act, and that's that's the first crackdown. And funny enough, I actually have that because when I bought my Japanese 360, that was one of the games that came with the the bundle that I bought from – 
uh, read McKnight on Arf Generation. And so, <clears throat> yeah, I, I noticed that. It was the Lupin the Third art style there on the front. He's a man of culture. Indeed. Jam Master J says Horizon Zero Dawn. I knew it was getting universal praise, but I didn't get the game until about two years after its initial release. I went in managing my expectations, but ended up having a blast the entire time. Yeah, Horizon Zero Dawn is definitely a fun game. I played all the way through the original and almost all the way through the sequel. It definitely ha- has a way of getting its hooks into you for an open world game with the different ways that you can do crafting without making it seem monotonous. I really enjoy my time with that and discovering the story. There, Have you had a chance to try this game yet? I have not. Um, oh, jeez. We're going to have to keep adding to your stuff here. I know. I definitely want to, though. Yeah, Her- Horizon Zero Dawn is de- definitely a game that you should play and I, there's some people who don't like it but it definitely give a chance especially since you're so much into breath of the wild and open worlds and stuff maybe you can make that your uh, spring break game yeah maybe um i definitely i definitely want to play it i have a copy on ps4 i just need to set aside the time to play it uh sean our pal Sean from Press Playcast says, My wife and I are always looking for couch co-op campaigns, and we weren't expecting much from the first Templar, but it ended up being one of our favorites, and we're always talking about playing through it again. That's one of those games that I avoided because the review scores were terrible. Oh, really? I mean, this is like one, like a five or six, I think. And people are just bashing this game left and right, but... You know, and if Sean likes it, I'll give it another chance. Hmm. I think it's pretty cheap on the 360. It might be, might be one to give it a look at, especially for couch co-op. Sure. Those games are rare and rare. Or should I say rarer than a rare game without googly eyes? <laughs> Our next comment comes to us from Cinco Play. There was a copy of Roll of Rose at the local game shop for years. Slowly some faded by the window because nobody, myself included, thought it would be worth the $30 price tag. I only played there and it was hundreds to buy. Then I bought it anyway. It was that good. Roll of Rose, and I'm going to make a confession, was a game that I bought with the intention of playing. And by the time I got around to it, it was so expensive, I never opened it. <laughs> So I uh, <laughs> paid like 50 or $60 for this PS2 copy of Rural Rose with the soundtrack, and it's still sitting sealed. Well, it's like my uh, I've got a sealed copy of Gotcha Force I wanted to get to, but now the game is like you know, anywhere between $1,000 and $4,000. So you know what? At this point, I'll just do an ODE. But it, it's on my backlog, and I, I need to try it out because it's, it's extremely controversial. But at, at the same time, I have heard a lot of praise for it. Yeah, it's interesting because I've I've heard the opposite recently. Um, who was it? Um, someone mentioned that in the... Oh, hang on a second. Was someone... it Duke Togo? It says it's not Dark Souls. Well, it was someone in the in the collector cast discord. And I think Kelsey was talking about it on the uh, podcast there, but somebody who's in the group had it and played it to get it off the backlog. And apparently they didn't like it at all. They thought it was boring and not very good. So it's always interesting when, you know, games hit people different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could almost think of it in some ways like um, like Earthbound in the way that... And, and I don't mean play, really, but uh, it's one of those games that everyone just covets, but you know half the people covet it just because it's got the price tag associated with it. Right. So, yeah, I, I'm hoping that one day gets 
time time to through this. And of course, I here I am nagging you about playing all these games when I've got at least three myself off this list. <laughs> right. Uh, Captain Buttershanks says, "Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time." This is a cool game. Uh, I had the opportunity to play this, and it is a multiplayer game, uh, or at least it's designed that way. But I had the opportunity to play this with some friends. Oh man, it's been a couple of years ago now, and this is a good time. This is a, a neat game, and it's definitely one that if you enjoy couch co-op especially, you should experience this. I'll have to add that to my list. I think they came out for PS4 and Switch, was that right? I don't know if it's on Switch. It might be, but it, I played it on PC. Oh, PC, okay. But, yeah, definitely definitely a fun couch co-op game. Our next comment comes to us from at Kami, sorry, Camille Korlitz. Korlick. Wonderling DX and Neko Navy. Now I haven't had a chance to try Wonderling DX, but Neko Navy is one of these titles that I, I go back to. It's just so quirky, and something about it sticks with me. It it definitely what reminds me a lot of the ways uh, that the um, shoot I'm trying the, again the twin stick that came out in like last October. It was on the these uh, never awake. Mm-hmm. That never awake does with it, sort of that that you sort of get that flash art style, but it really fits in with this game and the aesthetics, and you know you have uh, these pl- plants, and then this, I mean, what what do you expect from a game where cats are firing missiles and <laughs> a bombing? And what I mean, what is and no one's gonna go, yeah, 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 that's realistic. Look at that, that cat's bombing Godzilla. <laughs> no, it's just. <laughs> what you're gonna get out of it? You're gonna get a, a very uh, ridiculous game with with a SDG premise, but it, it's I don't know. It's it scratched an itch for me, and I definitely like Neko Navy. I was definitely surprised by that too. Wonderland DX. Do you know more about that game? Uh, no. But looking at screenshots, I'm getting a heavy Toki Tori vibe. So this looks like it could be fun. Tokitori, that's a fun game. Uh, ShmupDB says, Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. Played it on PC many years after the original release and didn't expect much. Probably one of my GOAT games. Oh, GOAT Simulator 3. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, uh, Dragon's Dogma, the original one, was one that I played when it came out and finished all the way through. That one was definitely surprising, too. If You, you should be able to find even the Dark Arisen, which is the base game plus DLC, pretty cheaply. I mean, it came out for PS3, PS4, Switch. It seemed like, you know, even even your favorite wrist, wristwatch or uh, Blender has uh, Dragon's Dogma now. But it, it's... Is one of those games I would recommend everyone just try and see if they like it because it's, it's very different than what Capcom has done before. It's an action RPG, but you you have a helper, and I for, shoot I forget the helper the actual name they use for it for the help, <clears throat> but you create your own helper or helper avatar. And you make it a mage, you know, a fighter, that type of stuff. But then you can also go and hire other people's <laughs> helpers or <laughs> mages or fighters to fight along with you. <laughs> I guess it's hard to explain, <laughs> explain it there, but it's one of those titles that captivated me, and I kept playing and playing and playing it until I had finished it. There's some interesting ways that, that the game... So they're like, there's some enemies that will only attack men or, or rush men, but they will ignore women. Or there's some enemy like ogres and stuff that will a- attack women, pick up women because they're infatuated with them. 
and so you sort of use your helper if your helper is a woman to draw them out and then attack from behind there's all sorts of different ways of uh, and interesting interactions that you don't normally see in these types of games huh. and uh, different skill sets and the story of course goes completely bonkers in many different ways but that's alright it's a Capcom game and it's you know uh, they're allowed to do that <clears throat> the game itself is so cheap I think it's it's definitely under 10 for the original game and maybe uh, like seven dollars if that you'd be doing yourself a disservice for at least not trying it hmm. okay and it, it's got it's got that people were making fun of it because the intro I don't want to call it butt rock but the, the guitar solo at the beginning was just so bombastic and over the top that it was uh, made fun of quite often when it came out huh it, you know, it, it, Dragon's Dogma is probably one of the best things to come out of the PS3 slash uh, 360 or HD Twins generation as far as action rope RPGs. And you you can find it on the PS4, you can find it on PC, Switch, it's on pretty much everything. So definitely give it a shot. And uh, if you don't like it, you won't be out much. Sure. Next comment comes to us from Walter3565, Gothic Wa Maho Otome. So, Gothic, yeah, I, think, I forget Wa, but is magic, uh, magic dating sim? No, it's, uh, it's Caves Mobile Gotcha Shoot'em Out. Oh. Uh, all right. As usual, my Japanese is, uh, Really on par here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did attend the Mark MSX School of Japanese Pronunciation. Yes, I did. So, but I got to say, uh, kudos! You got this one. You did this one pretty well. <laughs> Gothic wa maho tome. Yes. Yes. There we go. All right. So, Don Pachin was disappointing. Meanwhile, maho tome kept its variety. Healthy even after seven years. Uh, I have to. I haven't heard of these games. Uh, I'll have to give them a try. Gothic Wa Ma Ho and Tommy. Huh. Yeah, if you recall the um, the DLC mode in the new Death Smiles One and Two port that we played back in October uh, includes characters from that game, and so the new characters that were in the the DLC mode are. Are from Gothic Wa Maho Otome. Hmm. Okay. Oh, I'll have to check it out. And hopefully I can pronounce it. <laughs> Last Emperor Jubai says Trails from Zero and Near Automata. Regarding Shmups, Soul Crest Up. I thought it looked ugly, but trying it, I actually like it, even the graphics. Also, Radiant Silver Gun hooked me with the Switch release. Better late than never. Uh, Trails from Zero is on my list, uh, pretty high up there. The Trails, you know, Trails in the Sky. Uh, I think there, there's several of them out this time. I think at least three or four of them are on GOG. So I want to try it, but my <laughs> my time for anything that's. Uh, more involved than you know playing five minutes on really quickly on the switch unfortunately these days is very limited near automata was definitely surprising that game goes places and with the multiple endings on there very interesting game and it's pretty cheap now i think it came out to almost everything so if you think the one with all the dlc is like year of the yara or something so that but definitely Near Automata is definitely a game that people should try. It's cheap enough. I think it's under regularly under twenty bucks. Now, now Soul Crest, uh, I agree. It sort of looks a little ugly. I haven't a chance to try it yet because, well, it's on its way from Limited Run. They finally shipped it, so I'm looking forward to trying that. And Radiant Silver Gun is a game that shamefully I haven't have heard of. I know it's story and how much people love it. But I never have played it, so wow. sort of holding. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm holding off on that one until we can add it in for a game of the month. 
Well, to be fair, I've only dabbled with it uh, since I bought the 360 digital release. But yeah, once we have that physical in our hands, um, it's one I want to dig into. Our next comment comes to us from at Merman 1974 Power Wash Simulator. Now, I have seen people do this, and people get with the games. There's one that's like house cleaning simulator, and after watching some YouTube videos, I get it. It's very relaxing. On there, you know, it, talk about ASMR game, right? This will be it, and it's would surprise you on how relaxing it. Is. It is to do one of these things. It, yeah. no, I would say if someone's just looking for something chill and someone's on has a see it cheap on a Steam sale, definitely pick it up. And this is the kind of game that I feel like part of me thinks, why would anyone want to play this? But then I remember myself as a kid playing Skyjinx on the Atari 2600 and realizing... There's absolutely nothing to that game except literally just moving around to avoid trees and stuff while you're just flying. You're not shooting anything. There's no goal necessarily. It's just to fly as far as you can and not hit stuff. But it's a kind of simple zen-like gaming experience. So I get it. You know, and, and there's a huge market for this type. Of, I wouldn't say it's quite like Power Wash Simulator, but you have, you know, Truck Simulator on there, and uh, your favorite Farming Simulator. Hmm. Yes. Um, Rockley Smile says RoboQuest. And RoboQuest is one that I. I mean, I just looked up here. It looks like it's a. FPS with roguelite mechanics. Yep. For one or two players. So it looks like people really like it. I may have to give this a shot here. Another one for the backlog. <laughs> right. Our next comment comes to us from at Amber318 Nurse Love Addiction. Well, I hope it to be cozy at least in expectation. In reality, Photo of a soldier with a shock look on his face. Oh, gee. he's got that that nom 1975 uh, shocked expression there. <laughs> the one that could be heard throughout the arcade, just going ah. Right. So, huh. nurse love addiction. I have not heard of this one. It's a visual novel. Well, most of these are. Let's see here. Oh, whoa. <laughs> People seem to like it. Yep. Nine out of ten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course it came out on the Vita. Yeah. Of course it came out on the Vita. No, uh, uh, visual novel is something that I tried to get in, playing a couple of them to see what they were about. And uh, aside from uh, what's that one, Hotel Dusk. I think it was one the one that came on the DS. Huh. Is that right? Or I guess you could call Phoenix Wright a little bit of a visual novel in some way. Yeah. Yeah, Hotel Desk is the one that came on there. Hotel Desk Room 215. And they're for the S. Aside from that, and if you want to throw in Phoenix Wright in there, they never really stuck with me, but. Uh, it, it's definitely a genre that I can, I can see the appeal for. I, I just can't get into them. How about you? I haven't really got into visual novels, so yeah. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to try one. I'm sure coming up here because NIS has that visual novel slash um. What's a uh, um? Yurka kill. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want to, I definitely want to cover that at some point. All I can say is I'm glad you pronounced it. <laughs> uh, Bovaz said, I'm sorry to say, but it was Toho Project STGs. For a long time, I was tempted by them, but at the same time, put off by the fact that it's anime girls. 
Then recently, I started playing Mountain of Faith, and Fairy Warriors, and Hidden Star in Four Seasons. They are good. Yeah, 12 whole games are definitely good. They're in fact, uh, as Duke would like to probably say, foreshadowing here, we are... <laughs> We've got to be looking at doing a Toho game ourselves very soon. You know, uh, having a terrible night to have an imperishable curse. Indeed. So I'm I'm looking forward to that. I really did like uh, Imperishable Night, and I'm looking forward to getting better with it. The music is always a standout of the Toho games, and it holds it holds its own. There, I think there was something that. I, Showed you where they did a performance on uh, was it Samishan? Um of that or was that Bad Apple? I think that was Bad Apple. I'm sorry. Oh, that could <laughs> be. Yeah, I, th- I think Bad Apple's done and everything. There's probably a video of a cat doing a xylophone. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to to doing our first Toho game, uh, Imperishable Night, coming up pretty soon here. Nice. Uh, our next comment comes to us from at Schlarp. Immortals Phoenix Rising. I didn't expect it to be funny and fluid in gameplay, and I never thought I could prefer it over Breath of the Wild. Oh, he's cut off now, is he? <laughs> no. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, and I know Breath of the Wild is is divisive. Um, but yeah, this this one surprised me a little bit. I think because there was so much hype for this game and then it came out and a lot of people were, eh, it's good. You know, it's fine. So I'd still kind of like to play it at some point. You know, Immortal Phoenix Rising for me is one of the, I'm in the camp of, eh, it's good. I wouldn't put it at Breath of the Wild personally, but at GameStop, if you, well, that is if you can still find the GameStop open, it's like twelve dollars for twelve dollars wow. for a PS4 copy. Go give it a try. Yeah, I would say so. Kula Six says Earthbound. I wonder if Earthbound. So that's I'm assuming it's being the Super Nintendo version, right? Probably, probably Mother Two. Yeah. Yeah, Earthbound was the games that by the time I finally found a copy that wasn't, you know, six hundred dollars, <laughs> I was thankful to uh, be able to play it. I I ended up liking it. I mean, I may not like it as much as Pikmin Two K, but I enjoy it my time with it. Have you had a chance to try it out? I have not. I've watched him play it a little bit on stream, but I haven't played it myself yet. It, it's definitely one of those games that is out there in, in the way that does stuff but it it, it definitely quirky you know I, I guess with Earthbound it, it gets to call itself eccentric but <laughs> it, it's definitely a un- unique type game in fact the only two games I can think of that come close to it recently are uh, Citizens of Earth which is an indie game that was I think was bundled with. Um, there's a shoot a double bundle. One was done. The U.S. release was done by Limited Run, but you can get the Asian version pretty cheaply. And then the other game is Yakuza Like a Dragon, which is probably going to be more accessible for people. So, and uh, if you're interested in playing something that's similar to Earthbound, definitely give Yakuza Like a Dragon because I think that's regularly twenty five or below now. And if you can find it or try it out, Citizens of Earth. Though Citizens of Earth has a little bit of bug in some of the ways that it does with the game mechanics that you can break the game pretty severely <laughs> and exploit the level caps. So I, I would say try Yakuza Like a Dragon first. Huh. Especially since the sequel is supposed to come out the, either this year or next year. Oh, and you don't need to know anything of the previous Yakuza games to play Like a Dragon. Right. Mr. Chris Viking, in the last few years, probably Hunter, Call of the Wild, more than anything. I got through his simulation bundle and was curious, and now played it 2,563 hours since September 2020. Lately, definitely Vampire Survivors. Hunter, Call of the Wild was one of those games that I saw advertised quite a bit and never really 
to um, see if I can throw it on with my backlist or backlog. It, it looked pretty interesting. And then there was a YouTuber who I watched back when I had to get up at you know 3 a.m. for my <laughs> uh, previous job pre-COVID here <laughs> that I would watch her in the morning who would do a lot of the Cabela's, the survival games. Uh-huh. Those always look sort of fun and sometimes fun in a janky way, but definitely fun. And Vampire Survivors is a game that doesn't have a lot of heft or beef regarding its requirements, but I keep hearing that people really like that style of gameplay. And in fact, I think it already has a couple clones out there. It's one of the games that is high up on my list to try. Uh, I would definitely recommend you take a look at that game too, Guru. Uh, I think it's only PC right now, though. I think you're right. Uh, it's twin stick. Uh, Easy Racer said, "For any genre, it's Astral Chain. Not a big hack and slash fan. Looked interesting though. Couldn't put it down. Fantastic. For shmups, you win Squadron. I had heard good things, but I generally like verticals better than horizontals. It ended up being one of my faves of the genre. Yeah, Astral Chain is on my list." I like Platinum Games, and um, I bought a copy. I just need to play it at some point. <clears throat> um, but definitely one that I want to want to dive into. Yeah, Astro Chain was fun. I played through probably about a quarter to half of it before I had to return the copy I had to the library. But it, I definitely want to pick up a copy of my own. It seems like Nintendo just sort of... It's, it's almost suffered the same fate as ARMS, right? You went out there and then Nintendo goes, no, it doesn't exist anymore, but wait, 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 okay, here, buy this Amiibo. Now <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that just sort of disappeared. There were, they piped it, hyped it, hyped it, and then after it released, just, uh, like, it's one of those games that's even hard to find on store shelves, just like ARMS. Right. Uh, you're going to find used copies to find new ones are... Uh, in some ways, it, it's similar to like one, one, two switch. Remember that game? Oh yeah. Yeah. Try and find a brand new copy of one two switch. Or, or it's uh, things that everyone forgot about. That some guy's gonna go. I've got a graded copy of this game. Pay me four thousand dollars. <laughs> In a couple of years time. Anyway, that and you and Squadron was definitely one that I thoroughly enjoyed. Maybe not as much as Sarah or Ed, but it's. And definitely one that was surprising and a lot more fun than it made it out to be, uh, especially with, after reading the reviews at the time. Do you remember that for the magazine reviews and how they uh, tore it apart at CES? Uh huh. Yeah, I don't know what they were smoking. Our next comment comes to us from at Ryu Buck Up and Drive. I have not heard of this game, have you? I had not heard of it, but I looked it up, and it has this um, it has this art style that's hard to describe. I guess I would call it... Cell-shaded. Cell-shaded anime kind of look. Yeah. Oh, look, it looks like you're playing... Um... Oh, it is. This looks like uh, someone took the song Gas, Gas, Gas too literally or uh, running in the 90s this is this looks like somebody wa- binge watched a lot of um, what's it the initial D yeah and watched a bunch of initial D or initial D fever dream and then put on there yeah wow this car's doing flips and yeah I almost put this in, in like a Ridge Racer minigame here yeah definitely take a look in there I'm gonna have to take a look at this soon huh Uh, Goji Guy says, Honestly, Sonic Frontiers. I had very low expectations for it, and then I tried the demo at Tokyo Game Show and thought, huh, I might just have to pick this up. And then I ended up having much more fun than I thought I would, especially the platform stages with the time constraints. Yeah, I had a chance to try Sonic Frontiers because I was able to grade it from the library, and it after playing stuff 
of recent Sonic games, let's just say it's games that aren't Sonic Mania, I w- was surprised that it was def- better than I thought it would be as well. I don't like the direction. Uh, sorry, I should say I like the direction that it's going and hope they improve upon it. But I, it, it feels certainly weird, at least just in my opinion, to have sort of like a breath. Imagine Breath of the Wild, but then you play Sonic the Hedgehog in the middle. There was a little bit of a disconnect for me. Sure. But it was definitely better than most of the modern Sonic games. I have played Sans uh, Sonic uh, Sonic Mania. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm still undecided if it's something that I want to pursue. I mean, the last modern Sonic game I played other than Sonic Mania was Sonic Forces. And I know people like to hate on that game. I had fun with it, but I understand why some people don't like it. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I don't. I don't know if Sonic Forces will be for me, or uh, excuse me, Sonic uh, Frontiers. Frontiers. Uh, you know, for better or worse, it's gonna it's gonna be probably twenty dollars sometime this year or less. For better or worse, so you can give it a shot then and see for yourself. I suppose so. It's already a $40 game at most places. That, that, that is the way it goes with uh, AAA, right? You get like a, a two-month two window, maybe maybe a one-month window. If things don't go as planned, then after that, it's just a race to the bottom. Hmm. Yep. All right, our last comment comes to us from at D. Tunston. Guacamelee. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed Guacamelee. I saw Giant, I think it was Jeff Gersman playing this on Giant Bomb. And it came out and was disappointed it was PS3 only. So by the time I got it on PC, it had been out a while. But still, it was a lot of fun. I haven't had a chance to try the sequel. But the first one's great. You love uh, Metroidvania games, girl. I think you'd like this game quite a bit. Oh, yeah. I played through the first Guacamelee and had a lot of fun with it. I need to play the sequel at some point. But I I definitely played through the first one and enjoyed it a lot. So I guess now I'm wondering what game would you say is one that that uh, surprised you and you liked it way more than you thought you would? I actually have three of them. The first one I have is Steel Assault. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, wrong wrong game. But Steel Assault, Operation Steel, I'm getting too many steals. Oh. Operation Steel surprised me. From the initial impressions on there, it looked like it was going to be maybe a little bit more like a Flash game. Looking at that, I was thinking, this is still going to be cool, but I don't know. And then after I started playing uh, there with the roguelike elements, and it was one of the first games I played that was trying to be its own thing. It wasn't trying to go, okay, here's a shmup, but now instead of trying to avoid the bullets, you actually have to graze them. Like, you know, some sort of gimmick that everything was. This just, you know, so, and said, hey, this is a horizontal shooter. This is what I'm inspired by. How can I make this better? And it was the first horizontal shooter to really take in that 16 by 9 space, where if you got behind an enemy, the enemies would take notice it and take fire against you. And the different amount of weapons that you could do on there, and some the subverting of the expectations, such as with the... Um, Parodi- the talking or chatting Parodius with the horn that d- says different sayings, and then one one of them is just a hem or um, and then of course the the wiggles on there. I've got uh, two kids, and uh, of course I've <laughs> heard the wiggles in big red car. Who knows how many times? <laughs> but it's what was refreshing and something I don't normally see and the replayability of it was extremely high. It scratched the same itch that uh, uh, Starship X had done the previous year. 
The other game, two games that surprised me was uh, Soul Star. Soul Star looked to be one of the things that was interesting. When you think about STGs, you don't normally think of Brazil. And this game surprised me with its polish, as well as its John there, and it came really close to something I would highly recommend as being our, you know, focus shot for this year. But it just missed out by a little bit. I'm hoping we can go back to it, or maybe we'll move it to a focus shot for next year. But it, it's definitely one of those games that has solid mechanics and will keep you coming with the different ship types will keep you coming back and trying to get it along farther or get a higher score I'm hoping that we get a physical this year but the the one game that surprised me the most was gun vein mm. gun vein if I like ng dev team but they're STGs all have a certain style to them. They have a certain feel. And it was very refreshing to get something that was had the feel of Crimson Clover when I tried out Gun Vein. It surpassed my expectations of on their end ranks right up there with Futari for me. I am really impressed by this and it will definitely pick up the physical one it's released later this year. Nice. How about you? Well, you've all heard me blabber on about Breath of the Wild enough, so I'll just say that's definitely on my list. But I guess for me, a couple things come to mind. Uh, One of them is Axiom Verge. I was a big fan of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and a couple years prior, um, I had played Super Metroid and really enjoyed that. I uh, was kind of late to the party on that. Hadn't played it until, what, 2014? <clears throat> and I came to Axiom Verge in 2017, and that game blew me away. I was completely su- surprised by, number one, how much I liked it, but then number two... Just the fact that this was done by one person who had done the game design, the development, the graphics, the music, all of it. And it still kind of shocks me um, thinking about it. And so, yeah, that one definitely. Another one that really took me by surprise was uh, The Binding of Isaac Rebirth. I was kind of in this situation early in the Switch console life where I was buying new games that were coming out and looking for new stuff to play. And I picked that up on a whim because it was one of the few physicals that I thought, eh, yeah, I'll probably play this. And then I popped it in and very quickly put something like 25 or 30 hours into it over the course of you know, a week or two. And um, that one really surprised me as to how quickly it got its hooks in me and how much I enjoyed it. All right. Yeah, Binding Binding of Isaac is something that uh, it's one of my gaming shames, I guess, or game regrets I have not had a chance to try despite how many people have given it praise and recommended it and uh, I have tried Axiom Verge I haven't played in more than probably a couple hours though so I know you're probably going to pressure me <laughs> to play that I do own a copy of the uh, double pack I just uh, haven't had time unfortunately sure well the nice thing is it's one that you could definitely play on the Switch um, handheld and have a good experience so would definitely encourage you to go back to it at some point. Alrighty. Well, thank you everybody for your responses. And now, since you kind of already opened the door, let's move on to our focus shot segment and talk about our 2023 focus shot game, Gun Vein. All right. Gun Vein gives me... Uh 
issues with my vein here, just like Pac-Man wrist and, uh, oh no, sorry, those Roboton wrist and, uh, <laughs> pa- what's the Pac-Man? Pac-Man and elbow. I, uh, Pac-Man elbow, I swear after playing probably 30 minutes to an hour from this, just like Crimson Clover, my hand ends up cramped. There are, I'm going the way of geriatric John Mako. Yeah, I was feeling that. I, I was playing a little bit earlier, and I was playing a little bit yesterday, and I noticed that too, that uh, as much um, as much kind of press and release as you have to do for your um, lock-on weapon much like in Crimson Clover, you definitely get a little bit of that um, tightness going on. So that's probably just a sign that I need to carve out a few minutes every day to play this game so that I can build up that stamina. But this game... You know what you could do? You could t- you know how people wear gloves in order to help with their hands and build up stamina? Oh, sure. Yeah, we're just going to get you a power glove. Ugh. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, there you go. So that way you can build up stamina and power. Yes. But this game has definitely hit me right. I I, I dig it. Um, so far, I think I'm maybe enjoying Type B the most, even though it's a little underpowered. The fact that you have a much wider range for your um, for your lock-on means probably a bit more leniency in terms of routing. Um, type A, you have such a small conical area that your lock-on can do, and so your routing has to be a much more specific. Uh, so Type B kind of gives me the ability to sort of get in, learn a little bit, and get used to the movement, the bullet patterns, and all that sort of stuff. And um, so I'm I'm just kind of playing on mild right now, but I did spend some time, actually it was good, I spent some time doing the uh, boss rush practice early on um, just to kind of get a feel for it, and that was good because I was actually able to learn the patterns for the first two or three bosses and uh, then take that into the game with me. So it has actually allowed me to get relatively far relatively quickly. I can semi-consistently get to stage four in mild with type B. So I'm hoping it won't be too long before I'm able to get a clear. Um, and then I may have to go back and see if I can get that that clear with um, type A and type C as well. Now, refresh my memory. Is mild the uh, easiest difficulty or is it the middle? I forget. It's the easiest, yeah. Okay. It is, I, I suppose we should explain here. Gun vein, and for those who play Crimson Clover, even Crimson Clover has a bit of a down spot, right? With your normal STG, you're going to be getting your, your popcorn usually to start off with, and followed by probably some mid boss there, then followed by the stage boss. It's going to keep alternating a little bit to keep things fresh. Gun Vein doesn't give you that breathing room. Gun Vein, there's almost always something to do, whether there's to find a hidden score multiplier or bonus item or to destroy the popcorn in order to build build up your bomba score so you can you know you have three bombs and you basically collect bomb shards by destroying enemies and it was it is it seven or eight bomb shards in order to build a bomb that's ten ten okay so you're always doing something, so it, it, it can get a little stressful <laughs> on on your fingers and on your wrist. So, and you, it's going to be of course different based upon what ship you pick. As you mentioned earlier, you pick B, which I think is that the purple haired lady. Uh, no, B is the. Well, I don't know what color her hair is. It's the middle ship. Yeah, uh, the lady with glasses. 
Yep. And then A is uh, the one that I've seen people start out with normally. The guy with the red hair. I should I should figure out their names on there. You know, guy guy A, girl B. <laughs> we'll see here. Yeah, but it, it, yeah, I most people end up going with B, and that's what I was trying doing with the guy there. But he doesn't, as you mentioned, he just doesn't have the range that the girl and ship B does. And in fact, I think there there was a stream I was watching that you linked me to, where uh, oh, what uh, was it? Jamers who came in and mentioned that Type B is what you want to be playing. Oh, I don't remember. I th- I think it was Jamer. I could be, anyway, But if you really want to play for play for score and get out there, that and player that Ship B was where it's at. I think you're on the right path there. As far as the <laughs> playing style, I think it was the first STG I can think of, or that maybe one of the few STGs that makes you pass a tutorial requirement before it lets you play the game. Yeah, and the tutorial is interesting because to me, it it's kind of neat that it includes that. I mean. For those of us who have played shmups, it's uh, you know it's not as necessary to do something like that. But it is kind of neat that it's included, so that for those who are not as familiar with shooting games, you can definitely um, definitely benefit from going through the tutorial. Uh, and, and you know, I, speaking of. Stuff. Are you using a pad or using your arcade stick for this? I'm using stick. Okay, that's why I. This is the game that probably make me buy an arcade stick because trying, doing all this on pad is annoying, to <laughs> say the least. I, I think that this game almost requires an arcade stick. Oh so yeah. I, I may have to. Yeah, just because of the movements you have to make on there. If you're constantly pressing your buttons on there, right, and moving with an analog stick, it, it's. Maybe a little bit too cramped. I wonder if it would benefit me to... Okay, in fact, the person who you linked me to, <laughs> finally enough, he cleared it in, uh, was it one hour after he bought the darn game? With uh, using our Xbox 360 arcade stick. Oh, I bet that was Icarus. Yes. Yeah. So having a stick definitely helps in this game. It's not required, but uh, highly recommended. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to putting more time into this, and um, definitely, yeah. definitely enjoying it so far. Yeah, I mean, well, what's the closest equivalent we can get people from? Do you think uh, Sade Ojo, SDOJ? Oh, I don't know. I haven't played that, um, but there's definitely some Crimson Clover vibes. Definitely, I would. I so agree there, and for as much praise as Crimson Clover gets, that is definitely not a bad thing. Right. Yeah. If it's mentioned in the same breath as Crimson Clover, you know it's in good company. Alrighty. Well, let's move into Shmup News. Alright, all the Shmup News you can use. Um, for those who are not aware, the Exceed series of games, uh, notably Exceed 3rd, Jade Penetrate, Black Package, uh, and the other games in the series, were uh, delisted from Steam on January 6th, uh, 2023, uh, due to the closure of New Media, who had the license here uh, in North America for Steam, but also apparently... There's been some discussion online about the uh, whereabouts or the status of the Japanese developer Tenen Sozai. Um, now, if you've purchased the game already, uh, you can still download it from Steam, but it's no longer available for purchase. Oh, I, you know, the stories like these make you uh, always worried about our digital future here and stuff. I mean, you can, there's certain, always going to be certain ways you can get the game, but you would always want to get it legally. Right. Yeah. And, and this is why I'm still a proponent of 
buying this stuff physically um, because you never know when a license is going to expire or a, a publishing agreement's going to run out, that kind of a thing. Yeah, and but to be fair, physical only does so much. There are times when the physical is just sort of a uh, thing on the disc. I remember <laughs> that uh, in the recent uh, uh, clearance sale for this this year that was done by Limited Run Games, they they were offering Lawbreakers for ten dollars and nobody was taking it. Do you remember that game? Yeah. Yeah, drink drink coaster for ten bucks. Yep. All right, Hyper Sentinel is getting a Nintendo Switch physical through VGNY Soft. Excellent. I am always happy to see VGNY do more stuff, and I'm glad that they also stepped up to publish the Pixel Heart games here in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, I've got the PS4 physical of Hyper Sentinel, but it's good that that uh, it's getting another another release. Castle, Shikiga- Castle of Shikigami uh, and its sequel have been confirmed for uh, Nintendo Switch releases on April 13th of this year and will likely be based on the recent Steam ports. Do the um, Steam ports have the terrible voice acting? They do not. Uh, oh. I think because of the licensure from excess games which is unfortunate but uh part of me thinks that eventually someone's going to mod the game and and hack that in excellent because you know if the game doesn't have the game tech school of acting in it i don't know well i'm not sure that you can have any more impactful dialogue in a video game than I'm Kim of Two Homes and Seven Moms. Thank you for your wise worst of wisdom, Kim. <laughs> MSX indie shooter Shmup Kai, originally released in 2020, is now free to download thanks to developer Imanuk. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'll def- probably have to give it a shot on the Mr. First because I still need to get one of those... Uh, Multi carts for my MSX, but always good to see new software for the MSX. Yeah, and from what I've heard, this is a good game, so definitely one to check out. Uh, Rolling Gunner developer Mebius teased on uh, on Twitter uh, a photo of the Steam Deck running their forthcoming game, Elementaler X LX Falter. Uh, hinting that the game might be coming to Steam a lot more quickly than Rolling Gunner did. Excellent. Yeah, after playing Rolling, finally playing Rolling Gunner, I'm happy for anything more from the developer. The twin stick controls were absolutely spot on in that game. All right. And speaking of spot on, Hit Piece Studios is partnered with East Asia Soft to bring Shield Maiden MX to Nintendo Switch, PlayStation, Xbox consoles in addition to the forthcoming Steam release. Now, I had the pleasure of playing this game and in the beta form, you know, thank you to the developer for allowing it, me and you to give us a shot. I definitely have fun with this and looking forward to, well, if, if this goes away, I think it is, I'll probably buy all three releases <laughs> end up with an Xbox, uh, Switch, and a PS4 release. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing uh, a polished console release because they've done a lot of work to bring the current itch.io PC release along quite a bit. And if it's with East Asia Soft, they usually like to do special editions, so I wonder what they'll bundle it with. Soundtrack, maybe? Ooh, that would be nice. It comes with a drink coaster in the shape of a shield. I don't know. Uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's a Kickstarter campaign that should be launching soon for the highly anticipated Mega Drive and Genesis shoot 'em up ZPF. 
Excellent. Yeah, Mega Drive games are becoming more, or I should say homebrew Mega Drive games are becoming more common these days, and it's definitely a unique system with its unique sound. And I think the last game I played that was Demons of Astroborg. Uh huh. And that was pretty good. It was definitely different than I expected it to be, but it's still pretty good. Yeah, I it, I guess it's more like a, a screen. I guess it. Um, better way to describe it. I expected it to be more action oriented, uh, but it ended up being a little bit more like Rostan, which is not a bad thing. It was just different than what I thought it would be via the screenshots. Oh, sure. It, it's definitely worth checking out if you can grab a copy. Cool. A new demo of Typhoon Unit Butterfly Requiem is available from Itch.io from developer Ghostly Feline. Excellent. This is why, I, this is, as soon as I read this section, this is why I have no free time. I just spend all my time uh, trying out all these demos <laughs> in <laughs> homebrew games. Right. Uh, Metal Black S Tribute launches February 2nd on PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Oh well, yeah, perfect timing by us as always, right? As always. Yeah. And, you know, I am definitely glad to see more Metal Black here. I wonder if it's going to run into the same problems. I'm sure everyone's running the same thing. Of Will it lag? <laughs> I'm going ha- to have to tell Mar- Mark MSX that that'll be his new, new video series. <laughs> Will it Will lag? It- Will it lag, yes. Angel at Dusk from developer uh, Ikira Goya and publisher Hiteko Dojin now has a Steam page with a planned 2023 release and the demos available. Excellent. Yeah, and of course this is from the same dev who did um, Steel Vampire that we covered earlier in the podcast. Yeah, I definitely like the gameplay of Steel Vampire, but the audio was a little bit blown out, so hopefully uh, don't have that problem. Yes. Uh, the long planned game Ubusana uh, was previously thought to be a dead project, but according to the latest video presentation from M2, it is still confirmed to be in development. And on M2's official YouTube page, they have a, uh, what is it, a 14 minute video with some music that's supposed to be in the game. So. I guess it's still happening. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't give this a wise from your grave. <laughs> uh, and speaking of upcoming stuff that I didn't think would see the light of day, Macro Shooting Insight has been announced for Nintendo Switch, planned for a 2023 release. Yeah, and I'm not sure who's handling this, but it's kind of cool that we're getting a new Macross shoot 'em up. I, mean, I wonder how many how many Macross STGs are there. In fact, is there any other? Is there a Macross game that isn't STG? I'm sure there's probably a couple, but there, yeah, there's probably a couple. But I mean, there's Super Dimension Space Fortress Macross. There's Macross Plus. There's Macross Do You Remember Love? 2036. Yeah. Yeah. And there's yeah. probably a couple others I'm forgetting. Well, there's there's at least three in the arcades. There's Macross, there's Macross 2, and then there's uh, Macross Plus, as you previously mentioned. Speaking of which, when are we going to get our archived, archives Macross Plus release? Ah, uh, that would be nice. Well, now that they've done Mazinger Z, hopefully that means that We'll be able to get that, too. Let's hope. Um, Artist Mikhail Tillander uh, is working on another Mega Drive and Genesis shoot-em-up, besides ZPF, called Mega Wing, which is a vertical scroller. And I saw some screenshots from Twitter, and this looks promising. Um, I can't really describe the style from the screenshots, but... It definitely looks like something I want to play. I, if you want to play it, that means I better buy a copy too, because I'll end up a shmup game of the month. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. All right, and Wandering Wonder Studio he has a horizontally queued em up called Molly Shooter Nozomi in development, which has a unique harpoon mechanic to grab on enemies and some obstacles and destroy them by pulling on them. You know what that reminds me? Uh, a harpoon. The last game that has something similar to that is uh, Boogie Wings. Oh, sure. Right with the claw on there. Yeah, that, that's something you don't see every day. Yeah. Yeah, so this one definitely looks interesting. And um, it's got kind of yeah. a bright, fun aesthetic to it. And there's one other thing I want to add to this. It's not in the outline, but say for anyone who's been looking for uh, Genesis or Saturn controllers, uh, Retrobit has informed us that they are looking to have a restock at the end of January or early February. So please do not spend $154 on a wireless Genesis controller on eBay. Just wait and you'll be able to buy one soon. I really like the Saturn controllers and uh, uh, being able to play Metal Black with a wireless controller or you know playing in the CPS2 ports oh, heck anyone knows that there are great Saturns on shooter or STGs on Saturn so definitely grab yourself a wireless controller while they're still in stock for sure alright alright all right. No. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the game we played in the month of December and the participants for December. We had Metal Fro, Addicted, Drake Tunston, Mighty Squirrel, Corkman, and Zoido. Thank you very much for uh, joining in the insanity that was uh, the month of December as we trekked uh, the Oregon Trail. Or, you know, this game, a better name for this game might be a Super Amazing Buffalo Adventure. <laughs> so, <laughs> the proper title is Super Amazing Wagon Adventure, and it is a parody game based upon the Oregon Trail. Uh, I think this game really hits people of a certain age, and by those, I mean people who were uh, growing up and experiencing you know, the Apple II in the early 80s. Is it the first Oregon Trail game came out in about 85, needs to say, and it was the first game that exposes to what a computer is and what a computer could do in some, you know, the teaches the hard knocks of life. Uh, some people might jokingly call it Dark Souls before it was Dark Souls, but the amount of ways that people could die or, or experiences setbacks uh, was forever. In fact, they're still selling You Have Died of Dysentery t-shirts. <laughs> I have seen the game called uh, Choose Your Own Adventure, Sisyphus Edition. It, 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 it definitely brought the hardships and brought life. And it was really what I would say, at least for those again, those of a certain age, what was a, t a touchstone. Just like the NES. I mean, it was so prolific. Everyone had either played it or had it or you know or had. Uh, uh, excuse me. Don't copy that floppy man had uh, bootlegged the copy of it. <sighs> and so, so we're, and this is a in space. Super ama amazing wagon adventure is a callback to. Uh, to that type of game <laughs> we'll get in a moment here but first let's go on a little bit about the game itself it was developed by a single indie dev sparse vector a one person outfit from seattle washington it was originally released on the xbox 360 as an indie game release and then later on pc do you remember the indie game releases where you could pay like a, it was like here's all the stuff that people have made and you pay like a dollar or so do you remember that program? Oh, on 360? Yeah. I remember hearing about it. I came so late to the 360 that, uh, you know, I didn't get to do any of that stuff. Oh. You know, it, 
As much as it pains me to say this, I think that it probably should have stayed around. To get rid of Connect. Replace. It. <laughs> <laughs> kept could have kept this thing because there was a lot of different titles that came out. This uh, I originally played it after I got it from a hum- humble bundle. Not too long after its release, I'd say sometime in 2014. And it was one of those things, that, again, that just like our question of the month, that really surprised me. It was doing something that is really hard to do in video game, and that is to use humor effectively. I mean, how many times have you, you heard the same jokes fall over and over or fall flat over and over again in a video game? And after a while, you just want to rip out your ears. Right. So, it was really important through that. It was released on Steam on October 17th, 2013. And there hasn't been a follow up, though the dev is slowly working on Go Plague Monkey Go since 2013. Uh, I was joking earlier that this would probably work well with the Go as a parody of the Go Speed Racer theme song. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, and speaking of, aren't there plague monkeys in the game too? Isn't you can't be hit by a disease monkey? So maybe it's just got a thing for him. Maybe so. So let's talk a little bit about the gameplay. Like Oregon Trail, you begin the game with a single cover wagon available to you. You can choose to go with a random party of three or create your own. And I'm certain no one ever used that to create obscene words or other things, just like Oregon Trail, right? Oh, of course not. Yep. You are tasked with making your way across the Oregon Trail to settle in the West. As you play, meeting certain conditions, you unlock additional wagons (laughs) to play the game, each with its own characteristics. Different segments require different play styles. Some are pure scrolling shmup style and others are twin stick. Some combined twin stick with scrolling. You pick up weapons along the way, mostly with limited ammo, to re- temporarily replace your drag- your wagon's default weapon. And, you know, I-, I was sort of thinking earlier today, after reading this list of wagons that you have in there, it almost seems like the dev started out creating a cannonball run game, but then just sort of got the idea to morph it into this. <laughs> uh. <laughs> because you speaking of which if anyone's still doing that let's make a cannonball run STG or something there maybe a racing game I was thinking the closest we probably ever come to that is like Twisted Metal in some way oh sure yep. alright back on track here the uh, first one is the Fast also known as the Space Shuttle the Fantasy known as the Carriage from Cinderella the Glitch the Minimalist the Diseased and the Primitive and then, then you, of course, you have your original wagon. Right. Here, and each one of these wagons has different shot types on there. I've, the original one is just sort of like a standard pistol. The uh, the fast, I don't remember what the one is for that one. Do it, you it's remember kind what? of the same. Okay. Wh- which one has the, uh, was it the primitive that has the eagle? Yeah, the primitive has the falcon. The falcon that just sw- <laughs> the falcon that just swoops up anything. It was like that buffalo, and it just grabs it and returns it to you. Right, uh, and of course the the list that you read off is just a handful of the car of the wagons in the game. There are others that you can unlock. <laughs> and then the let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that gives you, you know, one of them. It gives you the shot where. You shoot faster, and it gives you auto fire, but then you can only shoot a certain number of bullets on the screen. The survivalist. Was that a survivalist? Okay. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a uh, camouflage covered wagon, and you start out with the machine gun, but you only get something like 150 or 200 rounds. So you literally have to pick up almost every weapon drop that you see to make sure that you are not going to run out of ammo. And then the the glitch I know just shoots like these little glitchy bullets, the same as the original. Yep. Uh, the minimalist, I don't remember if that has anything different on there. No, the main thing with the minimalist is that <laughs> with most of the wagons, you know, you've got your party of three, 
and each of the people in your party have four hit points, essentially, or four hearts. With the Minimalist, you each of your party members only has one hit, but um, because it's called the Minimalist, it's it's tiny. So it's actually not a not a wagon at all per se. You have your your bison or your buffalo or whatever that's pulling your wagon or your cattle that's pulling the wagon, but the wagon is literally just you kind of your character sort of floating in the air. So it has the smallest hitbox in the entire game. And then the diseased, I think that one of your it, was that the one where it starts out your characters go down to one health, but if you pass the first level, they go up to full? I'm trying to remember what the deal is with that one. Yeah, the diseased is interesting. You unlock that by uh, when you when you trigger the diseased monkey um, event within the game. If you pass that event, um, then you unlock the diseased as a, a wagon. And so the wagon itself is riddled with disease, so your characters will randomly get sick throughout the course of the trip, and when they get sick, they'll always go down to one heart. Um, but the pistol that you shoot shoots diseased bullets, so when you hit something with that bullet, it creates this green splatter effect, and then anything else that comes into contact that will also get sick and die. So, uh, it, it definitely gives you a little bit of an advantage in that sense. Yeah, in, in some of the later stages on there, you're definitely going to need that. Or, I could see that even being helpful within the uh, Buffalo, <laughs> the Great Plains. Right. Uh, is there anything else that you could think of regarding the wagons themselves? Yeah, I mean, there are other wagons you can unlock um, if you... Well, there are some uh, some conditions that you can can un- get to unlock the, uh, the dinosaur wagon, <laughs> which is basically you, ri- you riding on the back of a triceratops, I think. Um, kind and of there are certain wagons that you can o- only unlock by doing the... Um- uh, and, and it's not really in this run. What's uh, the basically caravan mode, right? Oh, right. And, and so, to g- give an explanation, the uh, what's happened in certain parts in the game, you're going to be doing things such as as going underwater and or and then fighting a boss at the end, or you're going to be. Going across and fighting a herd of buffalo, it, it's playing these same sections of the game over and over again to try, in, in other words, to get the best score out of these that you can unlock by beating certain requirements. I, I know there's one where you're going across the buffalo, there's one where you're under the water. Was there. I don't think the outer space one was there. Yeah, the outer space one you can trigger occasionally, because uh, there's one one spot where you come across a river, and you have a choice to either ford the river and move through it, or you can jump. <laughs> I'm not sure how a covered wagon and and animals jump, but in the game you do, and occasionally that will trigger an event where you'll go up into orbit and then have to uh, avoid or shoot down um, asteroids and then also take out a satellite. (laughs) (laughs) That that part seems to surprise most people there when they jump into space. Oh, absolutely. Yep. And in some cases, you know, I think that there is a random chance with it. I, well, I should say, when you're jumping, I thought that it was based upon the wagon, which sort of events you'd get there. I thought you either get like the bear or you get in the pathway or something like that. But it just seems to be <clears throat> based upon the specific event. So it's not quite as um, wagon specific as I thought it would be. 
when, when you know when you're forwarding the weight, I thought like, oh, the fantasy or the minimalist, that it's going to be lighter so that way you can jump higher and you won't ever get that. Is no, it's just based upon good one of three events here, right? Is yeah, because when you when you jump the wagon, there's a chance that you'll go into orbit. There's a chance that you'll drop into the river uh, that you were would have had to ford anyway, and there's a chance that you'll land on the other side. And then when you land on the other side, that can trigger one of a couple of additional events, such as oh, you disturbed a nest of bees and now you're running away from them. Or you woke up a whole cave full of bears and you have to try and shoot them down before they can attack you. Yep, yeah, and then when you get into those type of sites, usually what you refer to in the Oregon Trail as the hunting sections, it becomes a twin stick. Right, and- yeah, it, because... Um, <clears throat> there are spots where you have to get out of your wagon in order to shoot down certain enemies or do certain things, um, such as there's a spot in the game where you stop and pick a wild berries. And when you pick the wild berries, then a lot of times there will be bears that will come out and or there will be a bear that will come out and want the berries. Well, you shoot the bear down, and then when you shoot the bear down, you might trigger a couple of things. Either the bear's family comes, and you have to shoot all the rest of the bears, or you'll trigger a pack of, of rabid squirrels that you have to shoot down. The rabid squirrels. Oh, the game loves to throw enemies. Just like with the rabid squirrels, there's a spot... Once you make, you have to make a choice after you ford or uh, jump the river if you want to go around via the desert. Was it? No, that's the third one, right? The, the second one is the plains. Everyone's got to go through that, where the buffalo come through, and it, it does various plays on that. Where it's, it's a, you get a little bit of buffalo, but then as the game goes on, it, you just one of the screens was was a day two million five hundred sixty eight. Buffalo, buffalo, buffalo. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's just buffalo, 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 buffalo. And then the screen is just full of buffalo, all moving slowly that you have to try and shoot down and not get hit. And there, one of the scenes I got was like, hey, we know you've been through this before. We're going to speed it up. Oh, yes. Yep. And buffalo <laughs> just start going through. I mean... This game is just ridiculousness and and dumb fun to, you know, the nth degree. It put my one of the parts there where we were going through. This is the, probably like late games, the th- third half of it, where you're going through the. It's snowing, and all of a sudden these wolves come through, and you got shit the wolves, and then after that goes, yeah, and then a volcano exploded. Right. Go <laughs> with love to, to go through, Ooh. and let's see here. The, oh, the, I mean, even the beginning and starts you off with how just ludicrous the the game is when you're shooting and getting animals for the hunt, and all of a sudden bandits show up, and the bandits have a machine gun or pirate show up. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, when you get to the end of the first segment and you get the bandits, then when you you get past the main batch of bandits, then you get a bandits on a wagon with a machine gun. <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to think of some of the other, but this, there's a satellite boss if you go into orbit. Yep. There's pirates sometimes in the river. There's uh, space aliens and mummies inside of giant spiders and bats inside caves. There's bears. Yep. No when, shortage of ways to kill you. When you get to the second river, if you uh, decide to swim and go underwater with your wagon, then if you get all the way to the end of the of the river, then a lot of times you'll um, you'll end up having to fight a giant squid. And at the, then at the end of this, one of the end of the stages, as you jump jump off a cliff, 
you land on the freeway, if I remember correctly, and you have to fight a cop car. Yeah, um, one of the one of the alternate endings is that yeah, when your when your wagon falls off the cliff uh, and you make it to the ground, it falls onto yeah, what is essentially a freeway, and you're you're having to dodge cars because you can't destroy them. Um, generally, unless you have the rocket launcher weapon, your weapons aren't powerful enough. <clears throat> So you have to just dodge the cars, which is difficult. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's a police car when you get to the very end. I'll never forget when you, we first started streaming this, or you start streaming this, and uh, you picked up one of the icons, all of a sudden the area was carpet bombed. <laughs> Ed's face up. <laughs> was that a B-52? All right. Yeah, I think... We were discussing that in in uh, the stream, and I think we settled on it being a B seventeen. Oh, jeez! You have to insert the clip there. B seventeen bomber. That's right. But yeah, someone—I don't remember who it was—but someone in my streams referred to the game as crazy pants, and that's a good way of putting it because it's just completely ludicrous. But in the best way. It is, you know, in for the three, for the three dollars it costs you on there. You know, you're not out of much if you don't like the game. Exactly. So the uh, the, the it's a good game for streaming too because it again we mentioned about subverting expectations earlier. It certainly does. People look at it and go, what the the heck is this then? Really, <laughs> and it takes you on there. I, there was the I'm trying to think of some of the I know the B 52 bomber or B 17, and this, and this was one that you were having problem with the squirrels for a while. The shooting this, learning that shooting the skunks and picking up the skunks actually decreases your health. Yep, and they're picking up the different weapons. Yeah, what? So now that we're talking about different weapons on here, what what is your favorite weapon out of the game? Um, probably the Falcon. You know, I'm gonna have to agree with you on that one. I mean, the The, Falcon is very useful. Yeah, the Falcon's the only thing that can kill something and then immediately retrieves it for you. Yes. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things about this game, too, is that when, when you take out animals along the way, you collect their hides or their pelts that you can then use to trade for goods. So sometimes that means you'll, you'll uh, be able to buy health refills and then more weapons or occasionally you'll get an arbitrary deal from a trader who will offer to sell you a different weapon or upgrade the existing weapon you have sometimes give you faster wagon wheels that kind of a thing or in some cases a smaller wagon so that you have a smaller hitbox yeah, one, one of the favorite things to try, because it's just absolutely ludicrous to even attempt this, is the gambling cowboy to yep. take him up with a ninja sword. Because you're trying to stab the flying pigeons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah now, if, if, you, if you had the uh, falcon for that, it's quite easy. But, uh, <laughs> right. And so I mean, there... There are traditional weapons as well, like a shotgun, which gives you kind of a spread, or the... There's, I guess you would call it a sniper rifle that is sort of semi-homing in the sense that it will auto-target an enemy that's not necessarily line of sight. Um, Or the bow and arrow, which is good because that actually has a piercing ability. And so there's a couple of sections um, in particular where that's useful, such as uh, there's one spot where you can disturb a bunch of giant ants 
and you always pick up a bow and arrow there because then when a line of ants is coming at you, you can shoot the arrow and take them all out with one shot. And then, you know, kind of use the, it's, this is a twin stick section, and you do that left and right to take out all these ants that are, um, that are coming on screen. Yeah, and the rocket launcher, I, even though you said it was very powerful, I earlier I don't remember that ever coming up very often in there. I think I said that once maybe every couple games. Huh. At least for me. Ninja Sword, yeah, the, I mean, there's a reason for that because it unlocks a special, uh, a special wagon. Yep. The dinos- dinosaur egg, I don't know what that one does. Oh, the dinosaur egg is interesting. So you, sh- you you throw dinosaur eggs, and then when the dinosaur egg hits something, then it hatches a pterodactyl, and the pterodactyl will then seek out whatever the nearest enemy is and take it out. So you sort of get two for one. That sounds pretty useful. Yeah, it is. And... Um, you pick up that weapon somewhere along the way if you trigger the event where you're on the beach and you find the eggs. Um, and then if you manage to get through that and uh, you unlock the the Triceratops as a wagon and then you throw the dinosaur eggs from there. Yeah, I may, I may actually made it through the game and made it to the beach, but I didn't see any dinosaur eggs on the beach. Ah. Just my luck. Are there any other weapons that stand out to you? Well, obviously the diseased pistol. That was a good one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean those are, those are the main ones. Yeah, I, I think one. I think that in the uh, B fifty B seventeen bomb or pickup is. Is the one that gets everybody going, what the heck is this? Right. Oh, there's also the flamethrower, which is oh, yes. uh, short range, but very powerful, and it works underwater. Yeah, it's all flamethrowers, too. <laughs> all right, so... As, as we talked about earlier, the game includes several survival modes, which can be a lot... And we mentioned these as sort of like caravan modes. Each one can be beaten by up to three minutes, giving you three stars on that... Up to three stars on that mode. We have Hard to Bear, which is a twin stick survival against bears. Pain on the Plane, which is twin sticks against zombies and rushing buffalo. Just Desserts. Through the desert in a wagon shooting, avoiding snakes, scorpions, and vultures. Fighting fish underwater with a wagon shooting, avoiding fish, jellyfish, and narwhals. The fighting fish always reminds me of the second stage of Jungle Hunt. Oh, sure. As, especially the Atari 2600 version with all the crocodiles and how uh, blocky everything was. Yeah, I can see that. And then, last but not least, we have Howling Good Time, Wagging Across the Snow, Shooting Wolves. There's also a Shuffle Mode, which takes the random events within the game and gives them to you one after another. You either survive for a short burst of time, or in some events, you take one hit and move on to the next. Each event counts as one day. The goal is to survive as many days as possible. I didn't try Shuffle Mode. Have you messed with that? Yeah. My best is 22 days. That's not bad. No, I I thought that was pretty decent. All right, now that we've covered the wacky and the zany, can you tell us a little bit about the graphics? Yeah, the graphics to me really kind of give me that Atari vibe. Atari 5200, 7800, uh, you know, Atari 800 or 8-bit computer kind of look and feel to it very much inspired by that or or like the Commodore 64 similar to that kind of look and feel it's got that chunky pixel art style where 
nothing is super well defined, but you can still kind of make out what everything is for the most part. Uh, it's very colorful. Um, some of the effects that are used in the game, you know, would not have worked on older consoles or computers, but they really help to kind of enhance the experience. Um, for example, when you um, when you have the diseased pistol and you shoot down enemies and it creates a green splatter effect everywhere, um, you know, there's a lot going on with that. Or um, some of the other weapons when you when you take out enemies, you see blood splatters everywhere. And so that's the kind of thing that probably you couldn't have done effectively on an older machine, especially when you're talking about taking out a lot of fish or a lot of deer, that kind of a thing, and seeing the, the blood splatters everywhere. Um, and when you first boot up the game, it has this kind of CRT effect on it with a little bit of wobble and uh, rounded corners to kind of look, make it look more like a uh, uh, like you were playing it on a CRT, which I thought was a nice touch. But some folks on my stream commented that it was a little bit hard to watch, so I ended up changing it to uh, you know just a standard view. Yeah, I think most CRT filters they look good when you are doing it yourself but when you try and capture to it most people don't like it and i think that was one of the things that my life and gaming mentioned when they do their capturing they turn off any crt filters right yes they're best left in the eye of the beholder yep so yeah the, i think that the graphics have a very very early uh feel to them as, as they should you know they're based upon the a apple II or you mentioned commodore 64 commodore 64 might be even a little bit uh too advanced <laughs> for this type of thing it really is that's something that you might see on the 5200 or maybe stretching for 2600 yeah 52 oh gee i'm just giving like five of trying to play this on the atari 5200 controller there <laughs> press 9 and hold down the button no <laughs> it, it's uh, yeah it really, really does do a good enough effect that you can you can feel it belongs in that era I think they did a very good job with it, emulating that look yep now the uh, sound on the other hand is very unique <laughs> I <laughs> the music is interesting it works but it's I, I don't know it, it, it's sort of like going to the opera and all of a sudden they start playing rap <laughs> it's not quite what you expected but if they can make it work it works right yeah, it's a sort of chiptune synthwave is kind of how I describe it. It doesn't really fit the aesthetic of the game or the setting or any of that, but somehow it still kind of works. And the game has limited speech, which you know, is broken enough that it makes it sound... I don't know... What do you think? you think it sounds better or worse than B-17 Bomb? Or? Well, I would say better. I mean, there's very little of it in there. Um, but every time you start a new game, you hear the Let's Go Adventure, uh, which is purposely, you know, downsampled a little bit and made to sound rough. Kind of like how I did for the intro to this podcast, where it's supposed to sound like it's lower quality, similar to what you would get in an early arcade game or, or early console game. Well, there you have it, listeners. We lowered our quality for you. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that was on purpose. But then you get stuff like uh, with the, when you get the Falcon, and every time you send the Falcon out, 
um, you hear the little kind of screech that the falcon makes. I don't know if that's a voice necessarily or just a sound effect, but you kind of get a similar similar feel for that. Yeah, I, it's sort of funny when I you you think about the way that the sound effects are done. It's like, yeah, they they definitely fit the aesthetic, but I was thinking back to some of the, some of the like Nintendo games. It was amazing when you had voice in the NES game, but, but then I remember Ghostbusters for the NES line. Yeesh, I don't think anyone wants to hear that again. It was probably a good idea they kept that. Right. <laughs> yeah, definitely unique on the music. On the, the sound effects work well, but the music is just yeah. And I know this was mentioned on your stream as well. It it feels out of place, but for the game, it works. Right. So let's talk about scoring. I know there's a lot about scoring in here. Uh, no, actually, there's none. <laughs> yeah, and there, you know, we had a lot of discussion about the game in my streams, but not a ton on Discord or on the forum. And really, I think Detoxin was the one who dove in the most with this game, other than myself. And so he shared some thoughts. Uh, he said, I just played some more and got the last two regular wagons, the ones triggered by in-game events. Got them both in the same run, but couldn't beat it today. The Triceratops is pretty good, though. Also, that might supposed to be a B-17. It looked too long to be one, but the tail really looks like they might be trying for a B-17. I just have the really difficult to beat survival modes, shuffle mode, and then the game with three travelers beat the game with all of the wagon stuff to unlock, and I'm not entirely sure I can do all that. And then later in the in the Discord, uh, Detuxton said, I got a new best time on Pain on the Plane, 2 minutes 37 seconds. I seem to get 2.5 minutes consistently on Howling Good Time. My best on shuffle is 21 days. So it looks like I might be able to get the gold wagon. I don't know about random or survivalist, and I seriously doubt the meta would have to get all the other wagons and beat the game with each one. I seem to remember having some difficulty with the Falcon, but that was the wagon I beat the game with twice. I may have gotten another weapon at the squid or had some incredible luck with the wolves being not as big of a deal due to get getting some other hazards or something. Uh, but yeah, D Detoxin really took to this game and uh, talked a lot about it during the streams and in Discord. So uh, it was definitely a hit with him. Yeah, I was happy to see him in some of those. I think it's he mentioned that his son said this was the best game we ever picked. <laughs> right. <laughs> But I mean, it, it was a lot of people going, "What is this?" And some people didn't like it, which is fine. But people who, uh, and there are some people who did. I would, you know, thought it was sort of funny that uh, Ed came on and goes, "What is this? Was that a B seventeen?" And then picked it up himself, you know, for three dollars and just you know something to pass the time and just enjoy some dumb fun. It's it, it was nice to see that this getting. Some recognition. I I hesitate to call it a hidden gem because I don't want to summon Metal Jesus. But in in the stuff that flies by the Steam pages, this is something that's definitely hidden. And it was good to bring it to light for uh, others to try. Yeah, and this is one that I hadn't heard of until you mentioned it to me a couple of years ago, and so I'm glad we finally slotted that in for this past December because it it definitely made an impression. And, and it, it, I think it's always $3. So if someone is uh, l looking to uh, give this a try, now go ahead and 
and grab it. I think that you can buy it on the developer's webpage and, and then get like a DRM free copy and then get a uh, Steam code as well. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I really don't have a very much final thoughts on this other than it's cheap, you know, and if even if you get five minutes out of this, five minutes for three bucks isn't too bad. Yeah, this might be the best three dollars you'll ever spend on Steam. And one of the things I noticed is that there are some negative reviews of the game on Steam, but most of those are people who played the game for five or ten minutes and decided they didn't like it. Whereas some of the highest ratings or best ratings for this game are people who have clocked well over a hundred hours on it. So it seems like when this game hits, it really hits. I might say it hits like a B-17. <laughs> Sounds about right. All right, so now that we got our final thoughts, and speaking of hitting, what hit for you this past year? Well, yeah, thinking about the top five games that we played through this year, and it's always difficult to go through the list and kind of rank in terms of what games you liked the best or what stuff made the most impact on you. I would say for 2022, I would say Operation Steel would be my, I guess, my number five. My number four would be Fire Shark. And I'll say that qualifying that it's mostly the Sega Genesis version, although with the M2 port making the arcade version a bit more accessible, you know, I, I think that that has merit. My number three would probably be Death Smiles. I was surprised at how how much I liked it, and also the fact that I was able to clear it within the space of a month. And number two would definitely be Raiden Fighters. Um... That game, that game really surprised me. I knew it was good, but I I realized very quickly that I had been sleeping on it way too long. Um, and then my number one shouldn't be a surprise. It's a game I already knew I liked, but I have a newfound appreciation for it now that I understand the game better and um, now that I have managed to beat it on at least one route and that is of course G. Darius and uh, I guess my honorable mention would be Viewpoint because that is a game that I always kind of like to go back to you just like house music admit it I do No, Viewpoint is definitely a good game. It wasn't in my top five, but I, I could definitely see why you put an honorable mention there. It's unique in the, well, <laughs> it's Viewpoint, but it, it's <laughs> certainly unique in the, in the especially within the uh, Neo Geo space here, where you, you don't have that many type of shooters in general, and something that would be, have this type of... Uh, isometric viewpoint that you get from Zaxxon. It, it, it's just not... You don't commonly see it, and it, to make a game that's fun to play out of it is uh, quite an accomplishment. Right. So now, what about um, your top five? Now my top five, well, they're, I, I think they're all Arizona. No, uh, my top five are Operation Steel at number five. I I think that, again, that is a worthy game, definitely worth playing, and even better when you can play on the Steam Deck. Uh, number four has to be Air Zonk, and specifically the Japanese version of Air Zonk. Because the Japanese version of Air Zonk goes to some interesting places, so to speak. Yep. Es especially with the cow fusion. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Arizonk is cutesy cartoony and it's just the right level of 
challenge. That, like there, I, I like the music. It really hits all all of the notes on there, and I think it's one of the better Hue card uh, PC Engine slash Turbo Graphics sixteen games that I have played. Uh, number three, I had to do a tie because it came down to the point of which is more historically significant versus one that you know I get a lot of enjoyment out of, and those were Death Smiles and Fire Shark. Uh, Fire Shark was one I, I really it was fun to play, but I prefer the gameplay of Death Smiles more. But Fire Shark is very historically significant, me and Topan game. And the arcade version being one that crushes people's souls. <laughs> so I had to to just throw it as a tie and say, I, I like you. I like you both. So <laughs> now, now, number two, I had to slot in a riding game. Because, you know, we, we played at least three last year. So I'm thinking, I think that I, I chose the original riding because of the music and just how much fun I enjoy playing the different versions. I didn't pick Raiden Fighters because I think that Raiden Fighters, at least for me, will be a series that I come to really love when it gets to number two. It feels like Raiden Fighters is a great start, but it feels like number two or maybe Raiden Fighters 2 Jet is really where it's going to be. You know, you got Chef's Kiss. So... I will have to put Raiden Fighters in my honorable mentions, where, where the original Raiden with Gallantry and you know, all of its influences, as we talked about earlier with Fire Shark and Toplan uh, uh, there. But it is the original one, you know, trying to sh- always shoot those cows. <laughs> the, you know, the different, just the little touches on it. There, right. I, I did think about Raiden Four, but honestly, by the time I was playing through Raiden Four, I. I like it, but I think I just played too much of it. At that point, I think I need a, a ride in four break. Not not like I need a coffee break like in ride in five, where it's like, no, I, I need a coffee break. Come back in two to three years. <laughs> this is just I, I just been playing that game so much because of the different releases. Right. I uh, need some different and well for number one, it's no surprise here. G Darius. I like the game so much, I ended up buying the Switch, the PS4, and then the PC. So, <laughs> I haven't bought the PlayStation 1 yet. I need to do that. But the PlayStation 4 version, if you watch out, it was as cheap as 15 bucks last month in the month of December. So, at that point, you owe it to yourself just to buy an extra copy. Even if, if you make a make a fish marquee on the wall or fish mosaic on the wall out of them for 15 bucks is certainly worth it yep speaking of which I wonder if we can get um, let's get can we get a uh, I'll have to search Etsy maybe someone's got a, a hacked Billy Bass that's been changed into Darius <laughs> only if it plays freedom <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. Uh, how about how about you press the button one and it just keeps saying I've always wanted sushi sashimi. Yes, I always wanted a thing called a tuna sashimi. <laughs> uh, All right. Or or uh, in G Darius mode, hit the button and have the fish of Billy Bass turn and look at you and say meditation. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so let's talk about what's coming next. Currently, it's January 2023, and we are like ACDC back in black playing Metal Black. Now, this is one that had always interests me, but I didn't have time to play much of it, so I'm gonna I'm currently play in Arcade Archives and I'm gonna try out the Saturn version. <laughs> the Saturn version. I looked at it yesterday, and I, I have all sorts of Saturn RAM cards, but I thought I saw it say one meg RAM card. Maybe I misread that. Do you know if it requires a RAM card? I don't think it requires a RAM card, and I certainly can't think of any reason that it would even use one. Maybe it makes use of if you have it. It's one of those things. Huh. 
That's I'll have to question. look at it. Maybe I misread the thing. And then in February 2023, here we are going to be playing our first Toho game, Toho 8 Imperishable Night. Yeah. And I, I just got that going on my PC and messed with it for a few minutes earlier. So I will be ready to go. Yeah, surprisingly for something that... Well, what was that made on? That was made for like Win- Windows 2000 and maybe XP. It runs pretty well on a modern PC. It does, yeah. So yeah, uh, finally finally getting to Toho. Yep, and just wait here. We'll spend the next eight years covering the rest of them. <laughs> Probably. All right, so we would like to thank Ed of Studio Uprints slash Bullet Heaven for the logo and repping that awesome orange shirt. I'd like to thank Kogoso for the outro and intro music. I'd like to thank everyone at the Press Playcast and the Collector's Cast. I'd like to thank Metafro for streaming, watching the Schmuck Club of the game, and the Parrot Dogs always... <laughs> entertaining and like to thank DJ Psycho M1 for helping to spread the good word of the shmup. Yeah, with the December to remember shmup event, that was pretty cool. Up and his shmup of the year was Metal Black. Indeed. I also want to give a uh, bit of a shout out and some encouragement to a buddy of ours, uh, Zagnorch, who really wanted to play Super Amazing Wagon Adventure alongside us, but has uh, been laid up with a medical issue going on the last couple of months, and so was not able to, you know, be near a computer or be able to play. And uh, so uh, just a word of encouragement to Zagnorch and... uh, I hope he feels better and and is back on his feet soon and uh, can finally, you know, get home and play this game. Yeah, I hope you feel better, Zaggy. And Zag has helped me out quite a bit, and I, he's, I'm <sighs> always disappointed when somebody uh, has to deal with medical issues or stuff. It's it's tough, and this is times when games can help out the most. So I definitely hope you get back to playing these games and join us soon. Uh, and thank you again for all that you, the help that you've given us. Absolutely. All right. Anything else that uh, we need to shout out before we close up? Thank you, Ovaltine. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, my mind's blank. What should I say? Uh, sure. I guess we'll say thank you for listening, and we will catch you next month.